Hi, this is Stan Bush. Hi, this is Stephanie Calvert. This is John Payne. This is Jack Hughes. Hey everyone, this is Britt Lightning from Vixen. Hey everybody, this is Prescott Niles. Hi, I'm Gary Stevens. Hello, I'm Kofi Baker. trying to make a fourth movie for years to try and atone for his sins with this one. Whether he gets it off the ground? Mm. I'll believe it when I see it. Alright, goddammit! What the hell are you doing in here? This is not my office. You damn right it isn't. This is Play That Rock and Roll. I'm your host, Joe Kay, and today our guest is Matthew Buck, host of the Film Brain YouTube channel. On that channel, you can find his content, which is all about movies. He has a show called Projector that covers new releases. He hosts the Film Brain podcast, and that clip you just saw was from his original series, Bad Movie Beatdown. He launched that show back in 2009, and I started watching shortly after. And if you weren't online back then, you have to understand that it wasn't like today. There just wasn't that many shows that covered movies in depth. So when I first saw Matthew's review of Beverly Hills Cop 3, I felt stunned to find someone who had not only seen the movie, but had strong enough feelings to record a whole review about it. As the kids might say today, I felt seen. <laughs> That review was what initially made me a fan of his, but what has kept me a fan for all these years is that in all of Matt's videos, he demonstrates a huge depth of knowledge about not just film history, but the movie industry as a whole. If you watch his stuff, you're going to learn something. So with the news of the long-anticipated fourth Beverly Hills Cop movie coming to Netflix, I figured there was no one more appropriate to join me here on this podcast to cover it. And since we both have such strong feelings about this franchise, I thought a fun way to celebrate this fourth movie would be to have a conversation about the entire series. So in this conversation, Matthew shares his thoughts on all four films. We talk about what works in each movie and what doesn't. We discuss the long gap in between the third and fourth films. And we also talk about the incredible soundtracks of the first two movies. Which, by the way, is something I hope you classic rock fans stick around for. The soundtracks for Beverly Hills Cop 1 and 2 feature some big moments from a couple of classic rock guys. Glenn Fry scored the biggest hit of his solo career with the soundtrack for the first film. And then Bob Seger followed that with the biggest hit of his career off the soundtrack for the second. So there's some cool music history tied into this franchise as well. If you want to learn more about Matthew, you can check him out as Film Brain on YouTube, Dailymotion, and almost all social media. Links are in the description below. You can also find his text reviews on Letterboxd. And if you enjoy his work, you should do what I did and sign up for his Patreon, where you can get early access to his videos, among other perks. And with that, here's my conversation about the Beverly Hills Cop franchise with the host of the Film Brain YouTube channel, Matthew Buck. So, what inspired me to bring you on today was... <laughs> your original old, old, old school review of Beverly Hills Cop 3, <laughs> which did you know that you posted that 15 years to the month ago? Yeah, oh, frighteningly, frighteningly. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of funny because uh, it's been a while since I've rewatched that video. It's 
as all video creators know, it's very hard to rewatch your old work. And oh, yeah. so there are bits of that review. I think when I repost it to YouTube, I actually added a bit because I I had actually genuinely missed something in that review. Uh, I think there's that bit where he throws the annihilator over the wall, and I'd missed that oh. completely on the first on the first try. So I was like, I'm just gonna add a new bit because why not? <laughs> but um. Yeah, at the end of that review, I remember talking about Beverly Hills Cop 4 because at that point, it was still a very distant possibility. It had been talked about for yonks and yonks and yonks. And I, I think I said something like, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, I believe it now. <laughs> I believe it now. <laughs> I suspect that that review was really born out of your love for the first movie. So yes, let's start with that first movie. You know, 1984, great year for film. Probably my favorite movie of that year. Top 10 80s movie for me, for sure. Uh, do you remember when you first saw the first Beverly Hills Cop movie? I I actually do remember when I first saw Beverly Hills Cop. And obviously I didn't see it when I, when it came out theatrically <laughs> right. because I was minus six years old at that right. point. Right, we were not around. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, so, so I didn't I didn't see Beverly Hills Cop until I think probably the mid-noughts. And I actually saw it in the probably the worst way of seeing it. I saw the television version first. Oh. The, uh, the, the, the dubbed for television version. Someone recently posted on YouTube the, the best bits from that dubbed version. It is hilarious. I remember the one that really stuck in my head was the bit where they're, where they're in the police station. And Taggart says, We're more likely to believe an important local businessman than a foul-mouthed jerk from out of town. foul mouth, And you have a pig face. To which, of course, in the in the uncut version, there's an F bomb there. But in in the uh, TV version, it's foul mouthed. You have a pig face. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> but I remember I remember that because um, it's unusual in the UK to air the sort of US television prints these days. It used to be a bit of a thing in the 80s and 90s, but at the time I saw it, that was it was unusual to see you know the television versions of that were made in america with the bad dubbing being oh, aired wow. in the uk but what was even weirder is that it aired as like a season of family movies <laughs> in like oh. saturday prime time so it was playing alongside movies like ice age and x-men in the same season and then there's here's a completely bolder ice version of beverly hills cop for you <laughs> I have not seen that TV edit, but it sounds right up there with the Big Lebowski and what Die Hard Two with all. Those, oh yeah, those it's it's not moments. quite as bad, but it, there is a hell of a lot of dubbing. It's it yeah. is hilarious. <laughs> the, the the scene where he's talking with um with his boss, uh, oh, he's right. dropping the f bomb every sentence in the TV version. You can just hear them inserting hell, hell, hell every time he says the f word, <laughs> and they it's not graceful or subtle in the slightest. Yeah, no kidding. Oh, man, I, I'm going to have to check that out. I'm a fellow police officer. I know what it's like to be in a stakeout. When I send that food down to you guys, that was from the heart. Bull. After you've seen it properly, you know, uh, what makes it special to you? What makes you such a, a, a fan of this movie? I, I think it's a pretty easy answer for a lot of fans of Beverly Hills Cop. It's Eddie Murphy. You know, you, you watch Eddie Murphy come in, and he's like a comedy tornado in that movie. He is so self-assured in it it's unbelievable like, it's his first solo leading role in that movie i mean yeah. up until that point he'd done what he'd done 48 hours which kind of immediately launched him as a movie star right. he did trading places and then he did best defense and we'll kind of leave that one in the car <laughs> but yeah so he, so this is like his fourth movie in but he looks so self-assured in front of the camera he knows exactly what he's doing and he he just completely commands the movie and I think that's that, that's totally the intention, because, of course, the famously it was intended for Sylvester Stallone, right. and then Stallone dropped out. Stuff that he intended to do for Beverly Hills Cop ended up being in Cobra. Yep. And, but they brought in Eddie Murphy, kind of gave it more of a comic spin on it, or at least I think that was how it started, then Stallone tried to make it more serious. It works so much better, I think, you know, with the Eddie Murphy version, because we eventually got Cobra, and I like mm. Cobra, but Beverly Hills Cop is such a superior film on almost yeah. every level. M Murphy is really working at the height of his powers at that point. He really is. Uh, like every single scene, he he's just 
on it. Just every, every time he walks into a scene, you never quite know where he's going to go. It always feels a little bit unsafe because you know that he's going to start ad-libbing. You know that he's going to start drifting off of the script. And he's really funny when he does so. Uh, even to the point where the actors are cracking up. There's that famous, um, the bit, the super cops bit after they've been in the strip club. And that was an entirely improvised moment. And you can see uh, John Ashton and Judge Reinhold are just holding on for dear life during that take, just trying to make sure they don't spoil it. You can actually see John Ashton doing like this to try and hide the fact that he can't stop laughing. <laughs> Just thinking about that scene, I'm cracking up because yeah, absolutely. Every line he, he delivers is is you know uh, from a, a seasoned comedy pro. It, it's just some of the funny st- funniest stuff of his whole career, which is impressive given how early it is in his career. Mm. Uh, but there's a lot of, of big elements about this movie that I, I think really work, and you know, so I guess beyond the most obvious factor mm. of them all, Eddie. You know, it takes a lot of things to make a a great movie that great. What are some of the other, I would say, big picture elements of the film that uh, deliver um, really well? I would say the the kind of the class element as well, because obviously that's a big part of it, the kind of culture clash comedy. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, he's going from Detroit, he's a streetwise cop, and he's going into Beverly Hills, very prestigious, very posh, you know, the upper classes, and... The, the 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 humor of Murphy's performance is him kind of riding in, using his street smarts, and just basically completely pulling one over on everyone. Like the the idea that he just walks into a place, can just come up with a story, and it just completely flummoxes them. It just completely yeah. just upends them, and they don't know what to do with it. Suddenly, he's just in here, and he's just. just absolutely in their face i I mean he just knows how to get a free ride out of it and he knows how to how to take advantage of any given situation you know he's kind of he's got that edge to him because he used to be a criminal and so he kind of he knows all the tricks and so there is a bit bit of a side of him that yeah he he's a good detective he's a good cop but he's also a really good con man in his own way and that's something that murphy would exploit in other roles obviously but that kind of sticking it to the upper classes that was very popular in the 80s there's a lot of kind of that sort of snobs versus the slobs kind of comedy you know caddyshack ghostbusters there's a lot of that kind of element going on in the 80s and beverly hills cop is perhaps the pinnacle of one of those movies it really puts that kind of front and center especially with the villain uh, victor maitland played by um stephen burkoff yep. who's a very well respected british theater actor uh, wow. i don't know if he he particularly respects the movie i'm certain this is one of those ones that he took for the money he's one of those actors that he, he does the hollywood stuff and then kind of puts it into the plays he and I, i've seen some strange stephen burkoff performances in other movies but he's he's perfectly cast that that almost kind of withering disdain. Maybe some of it is for the actual material itself, but it works for the movie. You know, he's, he sees Axel Foley and he just sees this annoying cockroach that needs to be squashed, just kind of interfering with his operation, but also underestimating him at the same time. Yeah, he is so condescending in, in mm. all of those scenes, and that really makes him like viscerally hateable. And yeah. it, it, it makes it so much funnier that he has kind of, you know... Um, a somewhat incompetent sidekick with Jonathan Banks, who mm. I think, despite screwing up a lot, still comes across as pretty intimidating. Role. It's a fairly early role for him. He's still got his hair, but I mean, yeah, he's still right. he's still kind of intense. <laughs> you know, the first time we see him, he, he's killing Axel's friend. You know, yep. he's he, and uh, James Russo, yeah, and he's, he's he's and he's he's quite frightening in that scene. He's just ruthlessly efficient, and then over the course of the movie, Axel kind of works his way past him at several points rather than directly confronting him. Going back to that scene that you just referenced where uh, uh, Jonathan Banks kills uh, Michael Tandino, (laughs) what I love about that character is that that's kind of a small detail of the film that really uh, packs a punch for me, is that friendship between uh, Mikey and Axel. They only have a couple of scenes together, but that like... Yeah, like three scenes. Right, but that friendship feels so real. 
And it's just like in in other movies with perhaps a worse cast or a weaker script, that might be just throwaway dialogue that's just meant to get to the you know the meat of the plot. And Beverly Hills Cop on on almost every level pays attention to those details and gets them right. Mm. You know, I love that scene of them in the bar. So, you know, I guess my question for you is, what are some other examples of, of stuff like that? The small details that on their own won't make a film, but when you add them all together, uh, that's what makes a, a great film a classic. That's a, that's a really good question, actually. I think, it, I think it comes down to the kind of authenticity of it. The, I, I, what Beverly Hills Cop does, I, I think, does a, it does a great job of doing is actually selling the authenticity of Axel Foley as, as coming from this environment, of coming from Detroit, and making sure there is a really distinct difference between Detroit and Beverly Hills. Most of the stuff in Detroit takes place at night, and you know it, it looks kind of a bit grimy and a little bit run down. And then Beverly Hills, everything is clean, everything's chic most of it is in bright sunshine. And so I think it does a good job of not only getting that, but also the fact that Axel, over the course of like the first few scenes that he's in Beverly Hills, and especially interacting with the cops, there is a noticeable difference in the behaviours between them, be between the way that the that Detroit police officers kind of handle themselves and the Beverly Hills Police Department do, which is very by the book, very much, you know, exactly how things are supposed to go and an axel here it, it makes them very it makes them very efficient but they're also not very well it, it seems like they're not as kind of intuitive as say axel is he's he's the one that's kind of telling them you know i you know the coffee grounds and yeah. they're like what, what's the deal with the coffee grounds it's like you you don't know what, what why they're packing this stuff with coffee grounds and is is telling that bogomil their boss who is probably the the cleanest car of all of them actually understands that whereas the whereas you know billy and taggart don't actually understand that yeah you know this might be the hardest question uh when it comes to the first movie um because i don't have an answer for this one but do you feel that there are any shortcomings or missed opportunities or even aspects of the film that haven't aged very well. If you look upon it now, it does look a little bit quaint by today's standards because we're, we're used to sort of action comedies that, have, that really push the envelope and really oh. kind of go over the top. Whereas Beverly Hills Cop, the original, is, is actually quite a low-key movie. There's, you know, plot-wise, it's not a huge amount happening in it and it's... And it's taking place in a fairly reserved fashion. It takes its time. It's not like fast, fast, fast. But it, it does a good job of holding attention, I think. It's, it still holds up really well as a movie. But it, I think if you're a, maybe a viewer that was a bit younger than me, that, that might come as a little bit of a surprise. I do think that that can occasionally catch people off guard. They can see these movies that set in motion, you know, whole genres. And Beverly Hills Cop is often credited with kind of pushing forward the action comedy genre as as a staple onto itself going back to some of those movies they they can look a little bit you know hesitant and a little bit experimental at times because they they are the first they are the prototype and there are movies that I've gone back to that say animal house for example I'm I'm not into say animal house I don't think that's held up as much as it has done even though it's kind of you know the forerunner of all those kind of gross out movies and things oh, like yeah. that Oh yeah yeah I I mean I'm, I'm sure we've all had examples of that where we've gone back to the classics and realized oh this this doesn't kind of work for me and you know that that there's nothing wrong with that necessarily it's just you know that it depends on the level of kind of sophistication you're expecting I suppose if I was being really nitpicky, if I was being really nitpicky, the one, maybe the the tiniest little thing that perhaps doesn't age very well, and maybe this is just with the context of it, is that bit where um it, where uh, Axel's kind of tricking his way into the country club, and he's kind of putting on oh. this kind of stereotypical gay voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that kind of stuff. You go. Yeah, that probably doesn't work as well, but that's probably informed by the fact that Eddie at the time was doing much worse things in his stand-up in, like, Delirious and Oh, Raw. man, you're not kidding. Yeah. yeah. And that really is not Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's probably one I, I don't think of just because I'm aware of, you know, how much more dicey it gets when it comes to his early 80s stuff. Okay, so 
it sets a really high standard. It 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 might be you know one of the great uh, foundational pieces of action comedy. So it's like a a lot of expectations for a sequel comes three years later. Different director Tony Scott on this yep. one. Uh, I love Beverly Hills Cop 2 almost as much as the original, but I know that that's not necessarily how most people feel. Um, mm-hmm. What did, what was your initial reaction to seeing Beverly Hills Cop 2? I think my my response to Beverly Hills Cop 2 has always remained kind of consistent with it. When I when okay. I caught up with Beverly Hills Cop 2, I, I, I kind of like some aspects of it. It's very much a souped-up version of the first movie, and right. the, the change in director is immediately obvious. Ma- you know, Martin Brest going to, to Tony Scott. Tony Scott just coming off a of Top Gun. Man, and Tony knows. Scott, you know, like, like, like his... Like his brother, you know, he had a very—he came from commercials, and he shoots with a very commercial eye, and it's—it's it's really whip smart pacing, like way faster than the original movie. Shot okay. in shot in scope. There's a there's a lot of uh, filters over the lens. Very much kind of sunset and golden hour. Uh, lots of people have said it's very proto Michael Bay in a lot of ways, <laughs> and actually, you know what? They're right. But at least Tony Scott, you know. You know, he, he may be proto Michael Bay in a lot of ways, but at least he had the decency to to still keep it to about a hundred minutes or so, and not yeah. two and a half hours long. <laughs> it's a very tight movie, very fast paced, very exciting, and I, I think that kind of makes up for some of the action scenes, which you know didn't quite mm. live up to the excitement of that you know that semi truck chase from the first movie. Mm. The heist it's, it's scenes funny. are fun. I mean, it's funny that you say that, because I, I do feel like 2 is the more action-orientated of the first two movies, because there's more set pieces in it. When you're looking at the first Beverly Hills Cop, you got you got the opener with the with the, with the the kind of truck chase, and that's great. And you got the shootout at the end, and that's great. Yeah. But really, there isn't all that lot in terms of set pieces, apart from like the, the strip club skirmish. As oh, that, that, that's a good piece. point. That's a good point. Yeah. I guess I mean that that opening semi-truck chase of the first movie is... It is great, though. It is just great. such a great scene that I don't think anything in the other movies lived up to that specifically. But you're right, no, there's more action. That, that is point. always the bar that all the set pieces are, are going to be compared to. And you can tell that they're trying to top that in the second one with the bit with um, Billy hijacking the, the truck halfway through the movie. Or, Oh, the, was it a construction vehicle? It's like a. It's like oh, a, the, the the cement mixer. Yeah, the after, cement truck, the, uh, and he's the... just smashing it into everything. There's some good, there's some good lines from Murphy in that. Are you, are you driving this? Or are you using the force? Or... Are you driving with your eyes open? Are you like using the force? There is some good practical stunt work going on, but it's more bombastic. But it's it's not necessarily more effective than that original set piece. It doesn't top it somehow. But I do think, from a from an action point of view, you know, Scott knows what he's doing more with that than he does necessarily the comedy. I think the the comedy doesn't come as naturally to Tony Scott, and sometimes you can kind of see that it does. I, I remember reading an interview with the editor who talk, who worked on both the first one and the second one, and he oh. said that the problem is they they watched the second one for the first time and they and they realized, oh shit, we've kind of forgotten the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> and I, I, there's three credited editors on this movie. You could, uh, you, you, that might accommodate for the, the the really aggressive pacing here, but I think they did have to go back in and kind of punch it up a little bit to just add a, a few more jokes, a few more wisecracks from from Eddie, because it does get a little bit lost in the shuffle sometimes because the movie's so fast and so quick, and it has to do lots of stuff because you know there's lots of high sequences and action going on but i so there are some there is funny stuff in in the second film but i don't think it's as assured but i think that murphy you know murphy he's he started out as being the young the young superstar now he's the assured star at this point I mean, right to the point where during the opening credits it's like an eddie murphy production over a shot of him putting his trousers over his underwear like if that isn't a big dick energy credit yeah. i don't know what it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is a that's quite a visual for the opening scene and that's a good point yeah at this point he is an absolute a-lister uh mm-hmm. you know firing on all cylinders uh, some of the comedy i think in the second one uh comes because they they've really developed the character of billy a little bit more i really yeah. like billy in the second one you just hit a car 
I know, I know, it's okay, I know the guy! He's a jack! <laughs> Yeah, I do think that uh, Judge Reinhold kind of steals some of this movie because they they give him much more to do. Like he's he was the young cop in the first movie, but they right. then they give him this personality that he's he's a gun nut. Yeah. <laughs> he's really into into the kind of Rambo stuff, which seem which obviously is an in joke to the kind of and of Stallone origins of it. Though like at one point they have, literally have Axel staring at a poster yeah. of Cobra at one point. So they, but I, I do love the just the running gag of them just going. Just kind of mentally going. Yeah. <laughs> it's just Billy. We need to talk. We right. really need to talk. <laughs> when, he, when he pulls out that forty-four Magnum while they're running, and he calls them dirty rosewood. I mean, <laughs> come on, that is so, that is great. One of the strengths of the movie is the cast. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not just the returning, but all of the villains are cast really well. The Gilbert uh, Gottfried uh, cameo, I think, is pretty mm-hmm. funny. Um, my my only letdown. With the with the cast is that it it feels like they they perhaps because of the editing uh, cut a lot of the villain screen time out of the, the the final movie, which is a shame because you have three really good mm. actors in those roles with Jurgen Prochnow, Brigitte Nielsen, and, and Dean Stockwell. Mm. You, do you feel similarly about that? I do feel similarly about that. Like on paper, that's a great cast. I mean, oh, especially yeah. Jurgen Prochnow and. Like, that sounds like, oh, he's going to kind of live up to what Stephen Burkhoff did in the previous movie. And Burkhoff, you know, actually, he gets far less to do than Burkhoff did because Proc now he gets one big scene where he's talking to Dean Stockwell. Yeah. And that's pretty much it in terms of his big scenes until, like, the end of the movie. They have that confrontation at the Playboy Mansion, but he doesn't say anything. He doesn't really respond to him in any way. Just Axel just walks all over him. You know, it doesn't make him into a credible threat. And I think it says something about, you know, Jürgen Prochnow's performance in the movie as it stands is that really Bridget Nielsen is the one that's by far the most memorable out of any of them because visually she has that look. She looks, yep. you know, very striking and she's the one at the forefront of all the heist scenes. Of course, I think you think it's very much almost kind of confirmed that her and Tony Scott had a bit of a thing off of you know behind the scenes oh you can kind of see that okay that, but um you know dean stockwell again good actor really good actor but not much of a part for him you know he's meant to be the kind of master planner behind all the heists who gets eventually set up over the course of the movie but again a really kind of forgettable part and both prop now and stockwell actually get kind of bumped off in really almost dismissive ways which doesn't oh, yeah. help that like like stockwell's character get he gets shot through the head and it's like a really quick shot like a really yeah. almost like you barely register it and the same kind of goes for for when Procknell gets bumped off by axe at the end of it when he shoots him through the through the windshield before the car goes up you, you barely have time to even register either of those and sometimes that i think that's where the the, the edit works to its disadvantage especially because I, I don't know about you, but are you do you really understand what the villain's plot is by the end of the movie? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> like a little bit. Yeah, there's there there's I get the insurance money thing. He's robbing his own places for the insurance, but then suddenly there's an arms deal at the end. It kind of reminds yeah. me of uh I, I suspect you're a James Bond fan, uh The Living Daylights has mm-hmm. a pretty convoluted plot that shows up at the end of the movie that gets a little confusing. Yeah, it, I think I, I think it's the same thing here. The, the plot is a little bit too involved, and it get it kind of gets a bit muddled, especially in the in the quickness of an edit. If you do like a really quick edit, but you got a lot of plot, that it can be very easy for an audience to go, "Wait, how how did we get here?" Yeah. <laughs> and that kind of happens at the end of the second one. So one one thing I, I do want to mention and i wonder if you noticed this uh going back to dean stockwell is that you are correct like on paper he has a nothing role like there's he probably mm. says 10 words uh 10 individual words all together uh, a lot of like i don't understand what do you mean but what i enjoy about him is that he makes some absolutely bizarre uh, facial expressions <laughs> and it ends up being really funny. And like, and maybe I'm grasping at straws because I want it to be better than it is. But like, mm. I at least give him credit because that strikes me as someone who's at least trying, even if it's yeah. kind of weird. 
Oh, oh, Stockwell, Stockwell's always an interesting actor to watch, usually. He's always doing something. It doesn't always work, but it's something, <laughs> usually. But he's kind of got the, the little, like, pencil moustache going on. He, yeah. he, he looks a bit kind of slimy and weaselly. And, yeah, I, I, I wish he, they, the movie took a bit more advantage of him. I Like you said, I, I'm... S- they must have shot more footage with the yeah. with the villains that kind of clarified what they were actually doing, but then they decide no that people are coming in and they want to see Eddie and they want to see Eddie be Eddie, and that is a fair that is a fair decision, but that comes at a bit of a cost. Absolutely. One of the funny things I noticed about the second movie is that we always think of Beverly of kind of Axel Foley with his with his Detroit Varsity jacket on, like that's yeah. a big you know that's the iconic image of Axel Foley. And one of the things I realized watching the second movie is that actually it's like it's like one of those Jason Jason doesn't get his mask until the third movie facts. He doesn't get the the the, the vasty jacket until the second one. That's oh. his look from the second movie onwards. Because <laughs> in the in the first one he's got he's got the, he's got this kind of black hoodie on and he's favoring yeah, he got, all these. Yeah. Yeah. Oh he, he, man. One of the weird things I noticed about Axel in the first movie is that he really likes um these kind of cut off. T- like shirts, like cut off right below the elbow, which is yeah. a really strange look. That's a very distinct look, but he, he carries that all throughout the first movie, and that's something that that never got picked up in the sequels. They that they they kind of adopt. So I think that Beverly Hills Cop two. I think that shows the kind of the strength of it is that it became part of the iconography yeah. of the character. It you know it's one of those things that that's interesting about big franchises is that sometimes the things that people most remember about them were actually from the original film. They came from what came after. That That is a great point. That is a great observation because I wouldn't have guessed that. I would have just assumed that the Letterman jacket is in the first movie. Uh, I, I couldn't pinpoint a scene, but yeah, if I rewatch it now, I'm, I'm probably going to think of that. So good, uh, good call. Um, the last thing I'll say about Beverly Hills Cop 2 uh, is that uh, the phrase... Uh, eat the floor from the uh, opening <laughs> heist scene. God, that makes me laugh. <laughs> All of you, eat the floor now. Eat the floor. I mean, Bridget Nielsen. We'll, we'll be honest. Not the strongest actor in the world, but yeah, presence absolutely undeniable presence. Oh, without a doubt, absolutely. <laughs> you know, first and foremost, we're for a, a music show here, and I'll I'll just tell you that these two cassette tapes. Uh, for the soundtracks I had in my first car back when I was in high school, and I know I'm probably the only one on earth, but in the mid 2000s, I would drive to school listening to, you know, The Heat Is On and The Pointer Sisters and Patti LaBelle and Bob Seeger. And like that was really formative for me. So, like, these two soundtracks are two of my favorite movie soundtracks ever. I wonder what, what is your impression of these, uh, strictly speaking about the music? The soundtracks are fantastic in the first two movies. They really are. Like they're they're such a big part of why the movies work. Harold Faltermeyer's score, like the instantly iconic. Yep. And the clearly the filmmakers knew it because they play it at every opportunity in the first movie. Yep. Like Axel does something really cool. Play Axel F. Like you got like it it does a really great job of just hyping you up for the characters. I mean the opening sequence, like the opening like the the great choice of the music in the in the background of that, it adds to it. And every uh, it's what I think that the first two Beverly Hills Cop movies are great examples of films that I'm not gonna say carried by the soundtrack, but they're enhanced by it. You know, the the even even the synth stuff that's not the X Left's theme, like the do 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 it add it hits exactly the right tone for the material it's it's kind of got a little bit of a comic edge to it Mm -hmm. but it's also got a bit of tension to it it's got it's actual genuine action it's not kind of either way it kind of builds a little bit of suspense at the same time but has a light enough touch about it and makes it really cool and in the same way that the axel f theme encapsulates the character so well it get it kind of gets his Kind of street smart attitude in a way that makes the film feel immediately playful and inviting and makes him seem like the the coolest person on on the screen and the the opening to beverly hills cop 2 is also fantastic i mean again looks straight out of a commercial eddie murphy's hopping in that portion he's running around like shake down get down you busted like great stuff Re- uh, again an, another way of showing an opening that just hooks you right in from like the first moment just fantastic stuff it's 
like and they just reprise that mostly for the second movie but again you know it's a great score of course you want to do that and i do think it's underrated you know that in modern franchises now consistency in terms of music my friend oliver harper he goes nuts about this stuff because he's really into the soundtracks of movies and he gets so annoyed because franchises these days they change composers every single movies oh, yeah. and they and they they like drop the themes from the previous movies and I, that's so annoying because they're an asset they're such a big part of of the identity of the movies it kind of annoyed me about the later die hard films in the same way michael Kamen's score on the on the die hard movies is such a big part of them and and marco beltrami doesn't do much to replicate them in in the sequels and luckily that's not an issue with axel f but you know, it's 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 something that you don't really know as until it goes away, which I guess in a way almost brings me to Beverly Hills Cop Three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I, I agree a hundred percent. And and uh, the one last thing I'll say on the soundtracks, just a little piece of trivia. You know, "Shakedown" by Bob Seger. That was uh, his biggest hit single, mm. which uh, annoys a lot of old school Bob Seger fans <laughs> who like you know. You know the good stuff from the '70s. I love <laughs> Shakedown, and I love his old stuff too. But uh, that was—it's—it's it's very funny to me that his most successful, of course, is from the soundtrack pop hit. You know, from uh, from the '80s. I've seen Bob Seger three times in concert, and he did not play it once. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bummer. Play uh, the hit? No. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah, but but you know what he did play instead, and I don't know if this will be as funny to you. He he did play all three times like a rock, which I don't know <laughs> if you know was that Chevy commercial for ten years here in the states. An absolutely <laughs> awful song. But anyway, we're getting off on a t- tangent. It's like you remember. I remember the Chevy ad. I acknowledge the Chevy ad. I'm not acknowledging Beverly Hills Cop Two. <laughs> right, exactly. What is he doing? Oh man. Uh, okay, we're moving on to Beverly Hills Cop Three. Bear with me just one second. There we go. <laughs> uh, go. <laughs> right. Oh, I so I literally watched Beverly Hills Cop three last night again. It's been probably fifteen years since I did that review and since I last properly saw it. Yep. Didn't get any better. <laughs> Didn't improve wow. in any way. Like um. Uh, just going into it, we'll acknowledge the fact that uh, John Landis is directing it. Uh, itself kind of interesting because him and Eddie Murphy had a falling out around the time of coming to America. So oh. that's a bit of an odd choice. Uh, and also that Jerry Bruckheimer didn't produce the movie. It's a completely different producer for that whole thing. So that might acknowledge why it feels so different from the other two. Uh, but that doesn't explain why this is so bad. Uh, it, it, it feels like a completely separate movie from the. It feels like some, even though it's rated R, it feels like a like a like a family friendly TV version. You know, it, of, it of is movie. strange because it is an R rated movie. There's a yeah. lot of you know, there is a lot of cursing in it, and there is some quite violent things that happen in that movie. Yeah, <laughs> and that's kind of goes into some other complaints, but. Yeah, it is interesting that people call it, oh, it's like the kiddified Beverly Hills cop. It's like, like yeah, I, I suppose it kind of makes sense with the kind of theme park environment, but it's not actually when you watch it, but it just kind of feels so watered down that it might as well be watered down even further. It might as well be just like a PG-13 version. Well, I and, think pointing out the flaws of the film uh, might uh, might be too easy. Let's start, let's give ourselves a challenge. Does this movie get anything anything right uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna be kind to it i will say okay. there's there is some stuff that it gets right i will say that the the sequence where he rescues the kids on the spider is a fantastic bit of practical stunt work Agreed. that is great like even though there's there's some ropey insert close-ups yeah, yeah we'll, we'll forgive it for that because the stunt itself is unbelievable like like it's the kind of thing that i'm pretty certain they wouldn't do these days because it looks really dangerous it genuinely looks unbelievably dangerous <laughs> <laughs> what we like <laughs> yeah 
Like, it, it, and it's genuinely suspenseful. It's the first time the movie actually comes to life properly at that point. One of the few moments it does, but, but genuinely comes to life for about five minutes. And I, I think that's probably telling because it's one of the few parts that's not really reliant on Eddie Murphy. It's, it's relying on a stunt guy. And yeah, so right. that's the stuff that works. And it's probably the best performed action sequence in the movie. Uh, is there some other stuff? Uh, Judge Reinhold is at least trying to do the best with the material that he's given. Yeah. I, he's not given very much, but I can tell Even that this. Judge Reinhold is he's doing his best with, you know, with the DDO GISISC. Is, is that correct? <laughs> it's, it's, it's such a weird gag. Like it's, I could sort of see a version of it where that gag kind of works, but it never finds a way of doing so, in my opinion. It, like, the gag that he has all this responsibility... And then in the middle of the movie, the big payoff is that he commands like everyone to just rally around a van and they open it and it's empty. Yeah. Like, oh, wow, massive payoff for all of that effort. Like, the way that that should have worked is that, you know what, I, I had a thought about this earlier. What they should have done at the climax of the movie is that when he sees Wonder World's going on, he just he does the same thing. He just gets oh. everyone in to, to go into Wonder World, and it just turns into this massive shootout. But he's vindicated because it does turn out to be a thing that he would need, you know, all of his resources for. That would make sense. It would make sense as a character arc. But of course, this is a terribly written movie, so they just forget about the angle halfway through. The comedy's too broad, and the action's too heavy. Like, the action is genuinely kind of nasty action movie stuff, which feels really wrong because the comedy's misfiring and the comedy is out of a cartoon. Like, yeah. the, the, opening, like the opening sequence is a great example of this with that, where they're in the chop shop and they're dancing to the Supremes, which is such a weird moment. It doesn't feel like a Beverly Hills Cop moment because Beverly Hills Cop is in realism. And now we have these chop shop guys kind of miming away and doing handstands. It's so goofy. And then they all get blown away. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, one guy gets pulled back by a, like a cord or something. He doesn't even fly backwards like a normal gunshot. They, they had that going on a wire and they just went... <laughs> right away, the opening of the movie, yeah. we want to talk about music. Well, the absence of music is a I... really big problem in Beverly Hills Cop 3. The opening seconds of the movie feel wrong. The yeah, opening no of the film... Card, nothing. Yeah, no title card, nothing. Just launches into this slow track down from the train onto Axel commanding the mission. No energy, nothing. Right. Completely, totally flat like what on earth if i was if i was like an editor asked to fix the movie my first thing would be well dudes get a title sequence in like the first two beverly kills cop movies had title sequences that made the audiences feel jazzed up yeah immediately putting a title sequence in and then kind of crossing into the chop shop stuff that probably would have worked that would have at least had a little bit of energy for like the opening of the movie, and then it continues throughout the rest of that Detroit sequence. Like almost exclusively, there is no scoring. The the first action sequence happens, and there's no scoring in the background of it. it. Like it just happens with just natural sound. There's no there's no like score to kind of amp up the tension. There's like nothing. There's no music until he gets in the car. They bring back the kind of Axel F theme and they remix it. And it's kind of interesting that the movie starts out by not doing a lot of scoring. And then by the end of the movie, it's really aware that, oh, things are things are getting a bit, well, shit and listless <laughs> and blast the Axel F theme as many times as possible. <laughs> yeah, and it's that weird marching band, like souped up version, uh, mm. you know, and it, which it later gave birth to that crazy frog song, which is just unforgivable. That that that, that was such a that was such a big thing in the UK. That Axel F crazy frog cover, bizarre, absolutely. Was that as much of a thing in America? I remember the ads for that constantly. Yeah, I remember being aware of it, and I saw the music video years ago. But uh, no, I, I as far as I understand, that was like a cultural moment uh, for you guys. Which yeah, oh yeah, in the UK, in it, was a, <laughs> it was an unfortunately big part of my teenage years. <laughs> Not for me personally, just having to put up with a crazy frog. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. Oh, and and one one last thing about you're you're completely right about that opening, and and Inspector Todd, who we yeah. haven't mentioned yet. Uh, Axel's mm. boss, killer role 
in the first two movies. One of the yeah. standout performances from a non-actor, by the way, a real yeah, he's cop. a real cop. He's a real cop, and he he again that that casting lends it that authenticity. He's good in the like the five minutes he turns up in three. Like he manages to get Eddie Murphy out of his funk, which I, I will bring up in a second. But like he he like he actually manages to you know make Eddie Murphy wake up for a half a minute. And then he's immediately axed because, unfortunately, the movie's following the usual pattern that someone gets clo someone close to Axel gets iced, and then that kind of makes him go to Beverly Hills. Is his death scene played for laughs? I genuinely cannot tell. It's so odd, like the yeah. the delivery of the coffee break line. Yeah. It's a funny line, and then immediately he dies. And Axel responds to it not as a joke. Obviously, it's it's meant it's meant to be like the the inciting instant of the movie, and he responds to it as such. And then they have a funeral scene. They have like a straight up funeral scene just to kill any more momentum out of the beginning of the movie, just make everyone feel depressed. <laughs> and then the big problem is Eddie himself. I, uh, I, we talked about how good Eddie Murphy is in the first movie, how sharp he is, and just how completely confident and assured. He is on camera, and that continues into the second film, and then in the third film, the like the lights are off. Like he's he does this thing all throughout the movie where he just kind of does the the smile, this really yeah. goofy smile, but he can't be bothered to come up with a line. And I, I, you know, I was talking about the fact that you, you can clearly tell that he's going off script. The the biggest thing that I can say against Beverly Hills Cop Three is that it never feels for a moment like Murphy actually gets off script. It always feels like he like he is rigidly adhering to the script. Yeah. And as I understand it, Murphy was quite depressed when he was making Beverly Hills Cop 3 because he was going through a bit of a kind of career slump. Like, the distinguished gentleman had underperformed. Like, he, he'd had that career as a pop star that was a bit misguided. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. we know. <laughs> that's been swept under the rug by the last few decades. So I think, I think for everyone's this, sake, yeah. Was this around the time that David Spade took that shot at him on, on SNL? Look, children, it's a falling star. Make a wish. Yeah, I think it was around that time. Yeah. It was definitely around that time. And he, he still holds a grudge about that to this day, boy, <laughs> Aldi. <laughs> but he, uh, yeah, I think there something was eating at Murphy at this time that he was having this this kind of thing where he felt like he was being pigeonholed in his persona, and he wanted to be kind of taken seriously. He want, and I'm not saying that Murphy can't be a serious actor. In fact, he's been great as a serious actor and stuff. I think you know, really? look at Dreamgirls. He's really good, and Dolomite is my name. That's oh. a you know fairly good dramatic and comedic part. But let's be honest, Murphy going, oh well, Axel wouldn't do this anymore. He won't be the wise ass because he's grown up. No, that's an excuse. That's an excuse on his part. He didn't want to show up. He didn't. It, it, I remember there was a, there's an interview like a Playboy interview from 1990 where they asked him about Beverly Hills Cop three, and he says something along the lines of. Yeah, they haven't really got a script for it yet. So, if, so if you see me turn up in Beverly Hills Cop Three, know that I got a lot of money. Oh. <laughs> and it does kind of feel that way. It feels like him going back to, you know, like an established hit, but then he's not doing it. He's not putting any effort in. And I lost count actually watching the movie again. Just how many times he looks bored in front of the camera. He looks absolutely miserable for like chunks of it. There are times where he just can't even be bothered. To pretend like he's having a good time in it, and it's it's really obvious that there's there's chunks of the script where they just went, we don't know what we're doing, but Murphy will punch it up, yeah, and then Murphy just kind of walks in and just does the script as written. Like the only time that I think that Murphy's kind of really on form is that bit when he's at the at the celebratory diner, and and. You know oh. the bit where they're celebrating Ellis to Wild, and he go and yeah. he kind of does, does the kind of shtick and tries to just kind of irritate him by walking up on stage. Ellis to Wild, yeah. Ellis to Wild. That's that's funny, and that's the only time that Ed, that Eddie Murphy does the the, the shtick that you want. But for the rest of the movie, he's not doing it. Like he, he, there's the bit where he where uh, like thirty five dollars, and then he just pays the ticket price anyway. Yeah. Like he doesn't do any <laughs> shtick to kind of work around it or. The fact that I, I forgot this detail when I was reviewing it, but when he got like in the first two movies, he blags his way into this like five star hotel, and then in the second movie, he he blags his way into someone's you know very big mansion house, 
And then the third movie, he stays in like an Econo Save <laughs> hotel. <laughs> like he doesn't even bother to try and kind of get one over. Like the class angle is non-existent in the third oh, movie. Big time. Yeah, they they lose the like they could have done something with it. They could have but the fact that he's working for this Walt Disney stand in that that means that that's kind of lost. I want to go back to um the awards show scene. I'm glad you brought that up because I had this thought uh when I was rewatching this uh this past weekend. Do you think there's a chance that that whole scene might have been inspired by the fugitive? Probably, actually. It does, like, it came out, what, a year or so after yeah, that? This it, does been, yeah. feel, it does it feel like the scene then, yeah. at the end of it where Harrison Ford's kind of going through the kind of dinner presentation. Yeah, it that, that is a good spot. That does feel like that. And then there, there is there is bits of Beverly Hills Cop three that do kind of feel like the fugitive, like they saw the fugitive because the last act of the movie is Axel goes on the run. So there's kind of that bit there. And yeah, it's a thriller. At, you know, maybe we could do yeah. that. Yeah, it forgets to be funny in the last third of the movie because it goes really <laughs> serious at that point. But yeah, you can like there's a, there's a bit of Die Hard in there. Stephen E. D'Souza wrote the script, although allegedly there's a lot of script doctors involved in that. So technically, it wasn't entirely on him, but. Yeah, it feels like bits and bobs of other movies, but not Beverly Hills Cop. <laughs> right. The other th big thing that that three is missing is the the dynamic between Axel and Taggart and Billy. There we go. Yes. Like yeah. Billy's Billy's here. Yep. But he's not here really because, and Taggart isn't because he's retired. And they've replaced, and they've done a find and replace, and given all this d dialogue to a character named Flint that we've never met before. <laughs> And he and both of those characters do nothing. It drives me mad. It drives me absolutely mad. Like they they watched the first two movies and didn't realize the big thing about why they work so much is that Eddie Murphy has a foil in them too. You know, like and Billy is as much a part of the gag as anything in the second movie. And then the third, third film, it's they go out of their way to keep them separated throughout the entire movie. The first two movies, I really feel like the core of that story is about friendship. And that is not the case here. There's no, you don't see much friendship between any of these characters. And that romance is such a lame replacement. Yeah. The the love interest, Paul Teresa Randall, doing her best with yeah. the stock role. The the introduction to that character is so forced, it's embarrassing. Like Axel is just walking back around like the the underground of this theme park, and he just sees a ride and he just walks in. He just yeah. walks in. <laughs> There's no reason for him to do this whatsoever. He just walks in. Just like, oh, I, I want to see what AU Attack is all about. Oh, hey, lady, I guess you're my love interest for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, just just re revisiting all this, it's amazing how we we start talking about one thing. My original question is, what what did the movie got right? And then immediately we go down the rabbit hole of all the we didn't even scratch the surface of all the stuff that got they got wrong yeah. it just piles up so quick and it i i guess i didn't think about it a whole lot because it's just the one i don't really watch but re-watching it is just like jesus like this is a movie really is junk like it's pretty irredeemable yeah. it, it's terrible it's really yeah. bad it's it's genuine like it's not funny bad it's just right. bad bad it's, it's just not a bad movie night movie yeah yeah. No, it, it really isn't. It's just lifeless on screen. There's no energy to it at all. Even even Pluto Nash, I'm I oh. can't believe I'm saying this. <laughs> Eddie Murphy looks more enthused in Pluto Nash than he does in Beverly Hills Cop Three. Beverly Hills Cop Three <laughs> might be a slightly more watchable movie. They're about equal pegging, let's be honest. Yeah. But you know, at least he looks like he's sort of trying in Pluto Nash, whereas he is Hosting beyond belief, it is the worst Eddie Murphy performance he has given in any movie. I, I I genuinely think that. I don't think he has ever given a worse performance in a movie than Beverly Hills Cop 3. Because at least, even when Murphy has maybe misfired and made a bad film, Murphy's not usually the reason why it's a problem. Murphy's, aside from maybe like a thousand words, which is like conceptually wrong. Oh yeah, but, it's, oh, I heard about that, yeah. Yeah. Like that's also a pretty bad movie, but Murphy Murphy's committing to a terrible bit that he really shouldn't be doing. Whereas in this, it's just like it's like his soul's been sucked out of his body. It's like yeah. 
Good God, man. Good God. Like, man. You might, they might as well have literally just sent him home. And they did, apparently. Like, Bronson Pinchot talked about the, the Annihilator scene. And he said, oh, yeah, at a certain point, they just sent Murphy back, back up to his hotel room and just had me speak off camera to John Landis because they can just... And I kind of thinking of that, I was watching it going, that explains why so much of the movie is covered in really tight close-up because they probably got Murphy's coverage first. Yeah. And then Murphy said, I'm done. I'm, I'm not, I'm not yeah. staying here to foil. I'm kind of checked out here. And that's why so much of the movie is in really tight close-up. And Landis's direction, you compare it to Tony Scott's, and it looks like <laughs> right. it looks like a television show. Yeah. Yeah, on every level. Production, everything. Yeah, real, real, real damning uh display from uh John Landis. Uh that should that, that's one of those things that people gotta remember about him among you know other problems with that guy oh but, yeah <laughs> uh not not we got it we got to stress this is not the worst thing that john landis has ever done it's <laughs> like my father holy cow <laughs> correct yeah yeah not the worst thing he's ever perhaps the worst thing eddie's ever done but not not for john no, all right no so uh at long last 30 years after beverly hills cop 3 here we are finally in 2024 with the Long, long, long anticipated Beverly Hills Cop, Axel F. As you said, when you did your review, there was scuttlebutt about that being yeah. in production. There, Like, Brett Ratner, I remember, was attached. There yeah, that rumors. was a big thing for a time. I remember because yeah. Eddie Murphy really tied his ship to Brett Ratner, which Ugh. is a bit embarrassing in hindsight. <laughs> but, like, they worked together on Tower Heist, and they were really into each other for like three seconds. That that, that Oscars hosting gig that never happened. That you know, oh god, all that stuff. Let's not drag all that stuff. Right, 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 right. <laughs> no, well, I mean, man. I think. What's even worse was they almost made a TV show based on a Axel Foley's son, and thankfully CBS passed on that. Yeah, how, that, how that popped up on the internet fairly that. recently. I, I I got a copy of it, and I completely forgot to watch it for this podcast, because I would have talked about it, but I've seen clips of it. And the oh, pilot is... Meh, it's, you know, what you'd expect a Beverly Hills Cop TV pilot to be. Uh, a, a Eddie Murphy pops in as, as the dad. He's the guest wow. role. And apparently a big reason why it never made to green light is because they show it to an audience and they said, we want more Eddie Murphy. <laughs> and Eddie Murphy wasn't going to commit to doing a television show. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Always love the movie star TV uh, dynamic. But all yeah. right, let, let's talk about uh, let's talk about what's what's fresh, what's hot. It's on Netflix. Just watched this last night. Beverly Hills Cop, Axel F. Before we talk about if we liked it or not, what would you say were your expectations and your hopes? And those are different things uh, for this movie now that, you know, we got it. Oh, man. Uh, I think I kept my expectations actually quite low because it's, oh. it's been a long time. It's yeah. been 30 years. I mean, and the last sequel was so bad. Right. Like the, the last one really was so bad. So it didn't really have a very high bar to clear to begin with, let's be honest. But I think my expectation was that it probably wasn't going to match the first two movies, but it was going to sail past the third one. Yeah. And my hope was that Eddie would be would be on and he would be really committed. And thankfully he is. Uh, uh, it ret my hope was that it retained the flavor of Beverly Hills Cop. It didn't feel like a generic kind of reboot, which is a thing that often happens these days it just feels like they've kind of brought the the actors back but it doesn't feel like it's in consistency with the original films it manages to pass that hurdle in my opinion yeah and yeah my, my hope was just be entertaining just be just be fun i think that was my that was literally putting the like, the, the barrier pretty low but you know <laughs> reasonably it won me over quite quickly actually like the the opening section in Detroit, there's some stuff that I think that Axel F has probably done the best out of the entire franchise, which surprises me. Um, namely, the the really really kind of playing on the dichotomy between uh, Detroit and Beverly Hills visually. Yes, uh, because absolutely. Uh, in the first in the first portion of the movie, when they when they're doing the Detroit stuff, it's in winter. It's in winter time. So it's all covered in snow, which makes the contrast visually even more striking than it already was. And it's one of those things where you go, 
why didn't they do that before? Because it seems like such an obvious idea. Mm -hmm. But it, it, I think it does the best job visually of conveying that. And the opening section where he's got the 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 snow plow and he's crashing that through you can clearly tell the kind of the 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 guiding line from the original movie with the truck sequence yep. they're trying to recapture the magic of that and also the bit with the with the cement mixer yeah yeah, yeah. you know the cement truck that that kind of works and and, and shake down like, you know it's nice yeah. to see those songs again yeah they bring the songs back and i have mentioned i have seen a lot of people mention that you know the the, the fact that the movie goes really hard with the new needle drops in the first right. 20 minutes kind of <laughs> you know what it works for me i understand why they did that it's a little bit cheap and shameless they, they oh, probably yeah. shouldn't have they probably shouldn't have front loaded it as much as they did but you know hearing the class hearing the kind of old themes immediately gives you that kind of revival vibe but also makes it feel immediately like, like a beverly hills cop movie it like i said it nails it mostly nails the feeling of the franchise it you know jerry brookheim is back on it feels like a like a jerry brookheimer movie it has that kind of a uh, kind of edge to it it's it's nice to see and um, eddie eddie is mostly back on form i would i i was maybe i'm being picky about eddie murphy's performance i think he's mostly here but I also think that, you know, it's it's been a long time. It's been 40 years since he first played that character. He's right. literally a different person. Yep. And I do think that it's hard for him at times to tap into that kind of self-assuredness that he had when he was, like, what, 22 when he first played the character or so? Like, he was really, really young, and now he's 60-odd. And that was the other thing I was a bit sceptical about was it, because obviously he's kind of pushing it at this point you know oh, we kind of get a lot of action stars that are doing the glory days and you go you know well he, can you really do this fight sequence or, or are we gonna like chop it up like liam neeson you know is it's not so it's not so much you know like license to kill so much as bus pass <laughs> you know, it's, it gets a, it gets very close to that territory but surprisingly i think that uh, you know any any carries it despite the, despite that, I ha I did notice if I'm being a little bit, I did notice there's not a lot of foot chases and things like that in this. Oh, one. of course, a lot of vehicle <laughs> stuff, a lot of vehicle based action set pieces, which is fine, which is fine. I get it. I'm not going to harp on it too much. So, what do you think about the? You know, they bring John Ashton back, they bring mm -hmm. Paul Reiser back. You know, it, it's like almost the whole. Beverly Hills cop family is there with the exception, I guess, of Ronnie Cox, who I, I would have liked to have seen, but I understand why he didn't want to do it. Uh, yeah. well, well, did you feel this relied too much on nostalgia or did it find a good fit of making it, you know, its own contemporary thing besides a throwback? I think it did a fairly good job of maybe keeping, like, it, it definitely rides on that nostalgia. We've talked about oh, that yeah. already, but it does a good job of doing enough new that it doesn't feel like it's just retreading all the time. Like there's definitely, there's undeniable callbacks, but it functions as a movie onto itself. It's not like a lot of these legacy sequels where it's literally just, Oh, we're doing the same movie again, but with new actors, it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's different this time out. And it, like, even down to the plot, like one of the criticisms of the Beverly Hills Cop movies is that all three of them kind of had the idea that someone next, someone near axel gets shot either they die or in the case of bogan mill they survive but they all you know someone gets shot and axel yeah. has to come back in that's not the setup this time they do a different setup which is just you know like even that is a small thing you go oh they got it they knew they knew what they were doing with this material and so you know there's enough new stuff thrown in there but there's enough kind of and even the nostalgia they don't like billy comes back and but he's not really back until like the end of the movie properly anyway but also the relationships with the characters they could have very easily coasted on those they could have very easily yeah. just had the actors kind of come in they they have their report with each other they know how to kind of just plug right back into that stuff and that works when they allow them to do that but they give them they actually gave taggart something to do in this in the taggart you know he's, yeah. the, he's, the, he's the new chief of police there's actually some antagonism with Axel and with Billy, there's a there's a conflict going on there that adds a bit of variety and a bit of tension, and it's in character for him to be like that. You know, he, he's defending his department. He and that, you know, that you know, it doesn't feel forced, but it also makes sense for the characters. And it 
it, like I said, it gives them something to do. It's not about just bringing the actors back. You've got to do something with them. Otherwise, it's just fan service. And Axel F actually resists that to a certain extent. So kudos on it for that. So actually developing a script and characters properly. You know, it's a real fine line to find that balance of like too much fan service and an appropriate level of nostalgic callbacks. I love the the st the, the Rambo jokes with Billy mm. is always funny. Like maybe that's oh yeah, just for me. they get the characterization right as well. They yeah, get yeah. back to that stuff, and it feels in, like it. It doesn't feel like it's just oh we're winking back to the second movie. It feels consistent in terms of his personality, so that makes sense as like an in like an in universe sort of thing, and. I mean, it's kind of funny that the, I did think it was weird that the MacGuffin of the movie, the the SD card, like it gets really kind of just offhandedly sort of just finished off. Like, oh, it was in the Rambo knife the entire time, and then they just they just have it. I guess they just like, <laughs> like it's it doesn't really matter. It is. It, it was funny. I I just you know hear, hearing him say the the line my rambo knife honestly made me laugh it's just <laughs> such a funny line uh was there anything about the movie that didn't work for you any shortcomings uh i think it does start to falter around the middle for me i think um i think it's a little bit too flabby uh i think plot wise i think it get it has the same kind of problem that beverly hills cop 2 did but in a different way there's there's too much plot but it's not tight enough to compensate for that so Again, there's a lot of procedural here that I feel is a bit is a bit on the slow side. It kind of bogs down the movie. Kind of, all, we got to get to this bit, and then we got to get to this bit, and then we got to get to this bit. It it does take a little bit of a, the wind out of the movie sails, especially after such a strong start. Like uh, you know, the the beginning of the movie gave me a lot of goodwill, and then by the middle of it, I was going, mm, I'm kind of faltering a little bit here. Yeah, the relationship between uh, Axel and his daughter, played by Taylor Page, I wasn't. I, I thought there was a little bit too much of that stuff. Like, obviously the stuff needs to be in there. It it feels a little bit too cliche, in my opinion, the way that it's executed. And there's too many scenes of them just kind of doing tit for tat. And mm. I would have liked to have seen a different... Like, their relationship does evolve over the course of the movie, but it really should have been more of an actual... More of a developed thing. It just feels a little bit stock, and I don't necessarily disagree with having that sort of thing. It's just I've seen it in so many different movies where they kind of bring in the kid, and then the kid has a yeah. bit of a, you know, has a bit of a chip on their shoulder about it. It it just feels a little bit by the book. But yeah, a good performance uh, from Taylor, yeah. and also a good performance I think from Joseph Gordon-Levitt. I liked him. Yeah, this. he he fitted in quite well, in my opinion. Uh, he gives someone for uh, for Eddie to actually play off of, and also because he's younger, he can actually do all the action stuff. He's he's yeah. clearly the one doing most of the actual kind of physical stuff in the set pieces, which makes sense. But I thought that him and Murphy actually made pretty good foils for each other. Yeah. So especially in the helicopter sequence, which oh. When I saw that in the trailer, it gave me a bit of pause. I'll be honest, <laughs> because when I saw it, it, it was one of those things where I went. Yeah, that might be taking it a bit too far, lads. I don't know if I kind of go with this, but in execution, it's really funny. Like, it, especially the way that Axel's kind of reacting to it, and then there's like this weird um, Christopher McDonald cameo, which is like, I think it's a Happy Gilmore like joke. Is oh it? Like, yeah, that's right on the golf course. Yeah, like he's like he's meant to be playing Shooter McGavin, but he's not literally playing Shooter McGavin for legal reasons. Of course, <laughs> but he's yeah. clearly meant to be Shooter McGavin. It's weird, weird choice there. But that's one. Of the, there is a couple of moments where they do weird kind of references to other things, like yeah. the one when uh, they're at the car lot. And the the guy behind the counter is an aspiring actor, and Axel is kind of sweet talking him. That's a good riffy bit, but it's just so bizarre that the entire crux of it is Jupiter ascending the Flop Wachowski movie. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what a weird thing to bring out of completely nowhere! Just have all these references to Jupiter ascending. <laughs> like they could have made up a movie, but no, they they decided we're going to go full bore and just absolutely take the mick out of it. What's a safe target here? <laughs> that is that. That's right. I laughed really hard at that because, like, that had to be someone. Someone on this writing the script saw that movie and fucking hated it, and. 
and was just like, I'm going to write this scene. <laughs> <laughs> they they hated it so much they had yeah. to license that out from Warner Brothers for the oh, sake yeah. of that joke. <laughs> well, I imagine that's the only way Warner's making any money off of it now. So why not, right? <laughs> like if they, if they went six months later, Netflix could have probably allowed them to do a Rebel Moon joke instead. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, you know I can't believe it, but you know I actually paid attention um, for the first time in a long time to uh the pre-movie press you know the today mm. show the e the news interviews like i watched a lot of them and uh i was surprised to discover by watching one of those interviews with eddie that i guess they're already in pre-production or talking about making beverly hills cop five uh, i mean I, I guess it makes sense because you know he's, he's he's getting on a bit like they can't they can't do it for another 30 years it'll be right. like beverly hills cop in a zimmer frame <laughs> does axel f make you excited or interested in seeing a fifth movie was it enough to reignite uh the excitement around the franchise for you i th i think if they can if they can carry on the energy that they they got from this one yeah, it it, it 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 might have potential about it. Like it it gives me a bit of possibility about it. And again, they need to do it quickly before Eddie kind of ed edges. Uh, yeah, Eddie ages out of the part. Yeah. I suppose he could edge himself out of the part, but really he's aging out of the part almost at this. Well, point. I mean, uh, uh, Judge Reinhold and John Ashton, unfortunately, were pretty close on this one, especially yeah. Ashton. I mean, I mean, Paul Reiser. They like they literally retire him in the movie as well. Yeah. Like they like they they do this thing. Uh, it did. Like I mentioned Top Gun Maverick. There were so, sort of elements about it that kind of reminded me of that. Where, like Maverick in that movie, Axel is sort of in the same place that he was all the way back when. But he's kind of committed to being like that person. And um, but all the people around him have kind of evolved. There is something a little bit kind of tragic about that in a certain way but the movie doesn't really go into that yeah it doesn't really lean into that too much uh, maverick kind of leaned into that but axel f it has it kind of it's on the sidelines of it but really isn't focused upon all that much which is exactly the right call because no one wants to see a depressing beverly hills cop movie we oh, have a third one if we want yeah. that yeah, i think it really worked well <laughs> in maverick but i didn't really need that to the same degree here no no it, w it would have felt unearned in a, in a beverly hills cop movie because you watch a beverly hills cop movie for it to be funny right <laughs> That's you don't really want the kind of emotional stuff that top like top gun did that well but top gun you know, it's actually adding something onto that movie that wasn't really there to begin with. There's sort of a gravitas that's weirdly earned with, with Top Gun that wouldn't have been with Beverly Hills Cop. And so if they keep... I think my notes on it would be they need to keep... They need to, first of all, do it fairly quickly, but yep. keep what the, a lot of what they've done in this movie. My biggest note, aside from, you know, making sure the plot doesn't get overly nested is perhaps having a stronger villain again because that's always been a problem oh. with the sequels oh, like yeah. Be kevin bacon's all right in this movie but i've seen kevin bacon do this performance before kevin yeah. bacon can play a slimy like corrupt cop in his sleep almost he's not and he's clearly having a lot of fun smarming it up i yeah. did love the scene in the interrogation room where axel psychs him out and tricks oh, him yeah. into, into looking into the vent shaft and then whammies him <laughs> you've been watching too many movies yeah that's good that's clever that that's is smart. good absolutely yeah. that that's good beverly hills cop stuff well, okay. Well, any any last final thoughts on um, uh, the series as a whole? I'm. I would say that Belly Hills Cop is a fairly consistent series, aside from one big blip. A Axel F. The greatest content you can say for it is that it feels like it fits into the franchise. There we go. It, Absolutely. Like even even the scoring, like the scoring goes yeah. back to those kind of classic synths at, at, at the point. At the point, it's kind of like clothing, you know. It's kind of like, uh, like Axel, Axel, the you know, Axel's jacket is kind of 
almost kind of retro wear and you know we got synth wave these days everyone loves synth wave on the internet and the fact that they've kind of gone back to the synths on the new movie it almost feels like it's kind of you know it, it was kind of passe at one point and now it's kind of come back around to being yeah, cool that's... again <laughs> it's taken that long for a sequel to come out that it's kind of swung back around again so yeah that kind of works in its favor i i do feel like that the first movie in particular is is a classic it's it's the model for a reason it's yeah and yeah, like as I said earlier, there there is parts of the first movie where I do think that you know it looks a little bit you know a little bit reserved these days. But I think time has mostly been exceptionally kind to it, and to a lesser extent, the second movie as well has held up very very well in a lot of ways. And the fact that Axel F it it, it works well. I wish that it was a, a movie that was actually in cinemas and not on Netflix. That's I feel like that point. detracts from it. Yeah. I, there, there is something to be said about watching a movie at home feeling different to how it does in a cinema. I, I, I I'm, 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 I'm a pretty big proponent of of seeing things in a cinema. I think that it would have had a different energy. Yeah, you, know, you know, the Beverly Hills Cop movies—they're good crowd pleasers. They, they, yeah. they were meant to play for crowds, and the fact that the new one isn't—it just feels wrong. It just. Yeah, it bumps yeah. me out that I'm more likely to catch a re like a screening of the first Beverly Hills Cop in one of my local cinemas as as part of some throwback, you know, thing that they're doing, as opposed to this new one, you know, which is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, modern, you know. Yeah, it kind of frustrates me, and I, I have bones to pick with Netflix because of course Netflix, you know, that they're, they're not playing the theatrical game and getting something like Beverly Hills Cop, a big property like this, that's a big coup for them. There's like, yeah, we can get the subscriber numbers in. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Wish you just play ball and just put your movies in cinemas and then put them on the service. It's really not that difficult. Everyone else is doing it, but of course you you think of it as the rivals, so... Right. <laughs> that's yeah. a whole other podcast. Yeah, that's a whole other podcast, but believe me, yeah, I've, I've rambled about it before, but, it, you know, it still annoys me. It still annoys oh, me. And I hear you. I'm right there with you. And, Especially because, uh, I, you I, know, I, there, there is a distinct possibility we might not get this movie on physical media. We might not be able to complete oh, the yeah. goddamn set because of this. Yeah, that makes me nervous because I do want I do want a Blu-ray or at least a DVD of that. Yeah, for sure. I, I know that um, some of the other stuff, like... um. Like coming to America, the the belated sequel to that. I never caught up with that. I didn't hear great things about it, but at least that got a physical release at some point. Oh, okay. But, well, I, that, but probably... that was with Amazon and Paramount made it, so it probably had a different deal than this. So, yeah, what can you do? What can you what? do? Like you said, you'll believe it when you see it. Yeah, be I'll believe <laughs> I, when I walk into HMV and I see a copy of it, then I'll believe that they put it out on physical media. <laughs> well, very good. Uh, I'll conclude here with one last question for you. Now that we've had Beverly Hills Cop 4 and we've talked about it, we've covered it, how excited are you for Lethal Weapon 5? <laughs> no, 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 no. No one wants Lethal Weapon 5. Yeah. Apart from Mel Gibson. No one wants that. Like, it was pushing it by the fourth movie, let alone the fifth. Did you ever hear about what... That might even still be the damn script for it. Did you hear about what the script was for Lethal Weapon 5 at one point, where it was just... What is it? Riggs and Murtar going on a fishing trip? And then Riggs leaves Murtar behind on this on this boat and then just does the movie by himself and then the last scene comes back and joins Murtar on the boat. That would have that would have sucked. No one wants it. No one no one wants to watch Mel Gibson in anything these days. Like, like no one wants no one wants it. The television series was alright. So the lead weapon, the TV show was fine until weird production. Oh yeah. So, I remember hearing but, about know, that. Well, it it worked. It probably you know if if there was an eighties action movie property that probably worked you know for a television series, it was better that than Beverly Hills Cop. I'll be honest, but yeah, it's no no. We enough revivals. Make new things, please. We can't be all revivals all the time. At some point, you do have to stop playing the hits and make new ones. So yeah. No, no Lethal Weapon 5. And only make another Beverly Hills Cop if it's actually good. Don't waste anyone else's time by, by making another one that looks like the third film. Because that, that would just be miserable. Absolutely. What a great note to send us out on. Uh, Matthew, this has been an 
absolute joy talking to you about these movies. You know, I became a fan of yours way back in the day because of you talking about these movies. So it's been oh, a lot of fun you. hearing you today. And I just want anyone who's watching, who's who's not familiar with your channel, that they should check you out. Because I, I do still watch your stuff quite a bit. Uh, your 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 depth of knowledge is expansive and, and unquestionable. But what really oh, comes you. through, and I want to compliment you on this, is you you have a passion you have a love of films that you don't necessarily see on other channels and i i have seen movies based on how excited i can tell you are for it in your mm. your reviews so man i just think you do good work and uh it's been so much fun talking movies with you i hope we can do this again sometime oh thank you it's been it's been great fun honestly i've, I've really enjoyed talking about it and that I, and you mentioned passion i that, that's that's always been the thing with me I, like even when i'm talking about a bad movie i always want to kind of have fun with it I always kind of yeah you know, I, I want i want the audience to kind of come in and i want i, I want them to feel like they've they kind of learned something at the end of it or they've kind of like makes them go oh yeah that does make me think like you kind of get more of an understanding for how films work because i i kind of view films as you know films have their own language and i kind of came in from like English literature and kind of media studies and things like that and that that's what excites me about it is that they are kind of texts and they are you know they're they're creations they're they're fascinating to talk about and I'm, I'm glad that comes through absolutely it does hey thanks for listening you know there's no shortage of great content out there so you choosing to spend some time listening to this show means quite a lot if you're so inclined, please give this podcast a five-star rating and a positive review wherever you get your podcasts. And share our links wherever you can. Or mention this show to anyone you know looking for a podcast recommendation. All of this helps us out a great deal, and I appreciate it. You can connect with us on social media, too. We are at Play That Podcast on Facebook, Threads, Blue Sky, and even TikTok. Or we are at Play That Rock and Roll on YouTube and Instagram. Please post a comment and say hello. Finally, Play That Rock and Roll is a proud member of the Pantheon podcast community. So if you're looking for more music podcasts beyond this one, trust me, start with Pantheon. You won't be disappointed. Otherwise, I appreciate any and all efforts you take to support us here at Play That Rock and Roll. Be sure to join us next time for more great music and stories from the world of classic rock. Mm -hmm.